good to be here with you. It's good to have you here with us, Double Creek Church of Christ. Whether uh, you're here with us in person or whether you're with us on Facebook Live or catch us later, we're glad you're able to join us here at uh, Double Creek Church of Christ. Pin right there. I want to uh, first off, before we get started, make a few announcements. I want to uh, wish everyone a happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Thank you for all those who have served, who have risked their lives for us, and uh, to keep us a free country. Uh, and so we want to start off just mentioning that. Um, thank you so much. We, thanks doesn't begin to even uh, do enough, but we're thankful for all the people who have been willing to lay down their lives and sacrifice for us, give up so much. Uh, I want to mention a few people, too, here uh, that are going through some times here at Double Creek as well. Uh, for those of you who know, Charles had cataract surgery. It was part of the process. It was planned uh, for his eye on Wednesday. Seems to be seeing better now, seeing a lot better out of his left eye. So recovery went, was going well. So he's at home. Things are going good. Uh, a few other people, Dennis Coe, uh, they've asked us to mention Dennis. He's having some difficulty walking around. Uh, he's having some therapy at home. And he's going to be going next week for some tests and some x-rays. So remember that. Uh, Jim Binkley uh, just went into Mount Airy Hospital yesterday. Uh, he got severe kidney infection. So, um, that's what my understanding is that right? Severe kidney infection. So, uh, he's in a lot of pain right now, and he's had a rough couple of months as it is anyway, in and out of hospitals and rehab. So, remember them. And then I'll, I also want to remember Miss Sadie. Uh, she's been having some issues with her legs, just some pain, uh, difficulty walking. She went to the hospital, I think, to get some x-rays, and I think she got a cortisone shot. She's having some high blood pressure, uh, elevated sugar, uh, and while she was at the hospital, uh, she took a fall and hit her head. Uh, I think she's fine. We talked to her on the way up here this morning, and, and she's doing okay. Uh, so just continue to remember her. The thing is, just being stuck at home so many times for people is uh, it's difficult. And for some of our older people especially, and maybe uh, other ones as well, they just, you're home by yourself and you just sit down and you don't get up and move around as much and your legs start to bother you and you start to have difficulties. And it's not just a mental thing for people just being at home, it's, it's other things as well. Um, and also remember someone from back home, she's my favorite teacher, uh, Ms. Miss Whitaker, Susan Whitaker, she, uh, She's had a rough few months as well with vertigo and balance issues, and she took a fall this week and just broke her hip and had to have hip surgery. And she's at home, uh, didn't know she'd have to go to rehab somewhere or be at home. She got to go home, so she's at home with her family and uh, doing rehab and everything there. So uh, there are a lot of people that we need to mention, uh, that we can mention, that uh, we can think about. Everyone's going through some different issues, different things right now. But uh, I want to open up our time with a word of prayer before we... Uh, start our sermon this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for just uh, your many blessings. We thank you for just the opportunity, the chance we have, Father, to be able to, to be in, in your word, Father, to be able to gather however we're gathering, whether it's in person or on Facebook Live or, or however it is, Father, just uh, to be able to fellowship, to be able to get into your word, to be able to, to see what we can do, Father, to learn from it so that we can be better Christians. Uh, Father, we pray that you ask, we, we ask that you watch over those who we've mentioned this morning, Father, people who are struggling with, with any pains and illnesses, Father, and just our nation and our world as we continue to try to figure out the best ways to move forward. We just ask that you uh, be with us here as a church as we decide uh, what ways we need to move forward, Father, and, and the best and safest way for us to do that. Father, we ask that you watch over our time here this morning together, Father, this service that uh, the words that are said will be honoring and pleasing to you. We just uh, lead us and guide us. Keep us safe. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right. So uh, it is good to, to have you here this morning, whichever way you're with us. And, and last week we started a new series here that I've been that I've put together uh, called Stronger. And, and last week we looked at how we need stronger homes. And, and today we're going to look at how we need to be stronger witnesses especially here in this 21st century. And, and we're going to be looking at uh, five verses from a letter, uh, from part of a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. 
And throughout the letter of 1 Corinthians, uh, you can see that the church at Corinth had many different issues within this church. And so Paul points some of those out. He, he opens up this letter like his other ones. He opens it up saying that Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, or whichever way he would open the letter. But he opens it up letting them know he's the one writing it. Uh, he then goes into giving thanks as he always seemed to do in his letters. He was such a thankful person. He thanked them for the church, for their faithfulness there. But quickly he goes into 1 Corinthians in the first chapter and he starts talking about their divisions within the church that they had that they should not have, that just shouldn't be there. And, and then he gets into this second chapter where we're going to be today. And he really shows me in those first five verses what kind of witness we need to be for, for Christ and how we should act. And so I want to jump right in and read the scripture passage, the, the passage this morning that we're going to be looking at and focusing on for our time today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in the first five verses, Paul wrote these words. He said, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And so today what I want us to do is I, I want us to notice that I think we need more or we need stronger witnesses for Christ here in this 21st century. And, and our witness doesn't really need to change from the example that we're going to see here from Paul, what he showed us here in these first five verses. And that's what I want us to notice today, that, that even though our world has changed drastically in the 2,000 years or so since the Bible was written, uh, the New Testament for the most part anyway, even though our world has changed, changed drastically since then, our witness must stay the same. And we have different, a lot more things now that we can use that they didn't have in our society. We have airplanes who can get us any that can get us anywhere so much faster. Vehicles that can get us somewhere faster. We have computers that we can do almost anything on. We have cell phones that are like carrying around small computers. The list goes on and on and on. We have greater technology now than they did 2,000 years ago. Uh, I don't know that we're more intelligent than they were 2,000 years ago. When you see some decisions that get made and the belief that some people have, you wonder about that, certainly. But we definitely have more technology and access to things that they didn't have 2,000 years ago. So nobody would, could, or, or would even try to deny that. But while we do live in a changing world, and it is a constantly changing world, one of the things that must be unchanging is our witness. And so my hope is today that we're going to see that this is possible with these verses. Now maybe some of our methods, maybe our overall way that we do things will change over the years. And they have changed drastically from 2,000 years ago to now. Uh, the way things are done within the church. But our message and our witness must remain constant. So we're going to jump right into this, this passage today. This into this with not much of an introduction. We've got five things I want to talk about. One thing for each verse that really shows us how Paul was such an effective witness then and how if we do those things today, we'll still be an effective witness today in the 21st century. Paul was effective even in a city like Corinth that he was writing to and so many of these other cities that he was going to. And when you look back at that first verse, Paul said these words to the church in Corinth. He said, that he did not come to them with eloquence or superior wisdom as he proclaimed to them the testimony about God. Now obviously Paul is writing about a previous time that he came to Corinth. He was writing this letter while he was not in Corinth. And so he was talking to them about when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom. And so when I read that first verse, here's what I notice is that our witness requires the right perspective. You think about Paul here. You know, this is one of the things that I love about Paul. There's much to love about Paul. He wrote so much of our New Testament. 
In Philippians, Paul talks about, and I've read this verse here a couple of times in the last few weeks, about how he talked about how our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And one of the things that he mentions about Jesus was that he was humble. And when you read through the letters of Paul throughout the New Testament, you constantly see that he was a man who had humility. Now, Paul was a man who was very intelligent. He was a Pharisee. He, he studied the scriptures from an early age. He memorized that Old Testament law, those first five books of the New Testament. That's something that would be required of you as a Pharisee. So he was very intelligent. He grew up learning the scriptures. And when you read his letters, though, you can see that he had a way with words. And I can just imagine whether he's in a small group setting, it's one-on-one -on -one individually, or if he was in a group setting, uh, at a, at a, where at a synagogue or anywhere else. I can just imagine that his words would captivate people. Probably the way he spoke probably captivated people. But all Paul can talk about here in this verse is this. I didn't come to you with wise and persuasive Words. I didn't come to you with any eloquence or superior wisdom, he says. See, Paul's witness was done in a way that he didn't use difficult words. He didn't speak in a way that was difficult for people to understand. He was pretty simple with it. He talked to people on their level. He talked to people with a message that they could understand. And, and you see, Paul was more worried, I believe, with making sure, I guess worry is not the word, but he wanted to make sure that people understood what he was talking about more than he was concerned with them being impressed with the way he was speaking. I think the best witness is made when we communicate with people on their level and they can understand it. And the beauty of the gospel is that it is for all people and that all people can understand it. We just have to make it known in a way that people understand it. You know, you can look at Jesus. He really didn't try to impress people with words or his eloquence or superior wisdom, which he had a much greater wisdom than anyone else. He spoke in ways that people would understand it. He did use parables that made people have to really think. But he used stories. He, he talked in ways and taught in some ways often where children could even understand. So you can look in a story from Acts chapter 4. Now, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had previously just healed a man. And they were arrested for, for their healing and then for their teaching in the name of Jesus. And, and these people, the Sanhedrin and the people around, they couldn't understand how people like Peter and John... We're doing what they were doing. How could they speak in this way? How could they uh, perform these miracles? They couldn't understand why so many people were listening to what they had to say and how they were doing it. And, and while Peter and John were appearing before the Sanhedrin after they had been arrested, Peter spoke to them. And this is what we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. See, in their eyes, in the eyes of the Sanhedrin and these other people, there was nothing special about Peter and John. And, and if you just looked at them, you wouldn't notice anything special. They were normal. They knew that they were people like fishermen, that they were not schooled. They didn't go to Bible college. They didn't go to a seminary college. They hadn't had in-depth study for years. They knew they were unschooled. They knew they were ordinary men. But yet they were astonished by it. See, Peter and John didn't need to captivate people with their great speech, with words that were difficult to understand. I don't even know if they could. Maybe they could. Maybe they couldn't. But they made sure to speak to them in a way that people understood what they were saying, what was going on. And the people were astonished. And the Bible tells us that they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You see, that's how it worked for them often. And, and that's really how it can work for us, too. Now, we may not walk with Jesus like they did. We may not get to talk with him one-on-one -on -one or sit down and eat with Jesus like they did. But when we become a Christian, when we become a follower of Christ, when we put our faith in him and we confess him and repent, when we're immersed in those waters of baptism, like it tells us on the day the church began for the forgiveness of our sins, we received the Holy Spirit. 
And if we have the humbleness that we need and we're not trying to impress people so much with their words, then people can look at us and be astonished. And they can say it's because they have Jesus. Now I talk about my dad sometimes from the pulpit, sometimes more, more than others. And part of that is because I love the way he preached. He, he preached a simple message. He preached for 44 years at the same church the last 28 years of his life. He did all the full-time duties at, at two churches. But a big part that I loved about his ministry was the way he lived. Uh, what I've said about this point, he lived that every day. He, he did things from the right perspective. He was never one who tried to impress people or change who he was or, or how he preached based on who his audience was. It didn't matter if he was sitting here talking to a group of farmers or if it was lawyers and doctors. You know, he was once preaching at a family camp in Hillsboro, Ohio. Uh, they have this every single year where people come together and, and, and they come for a few days and they just hear preaching so much for, and singing for three or, three or four days. And, and he had the opportunity, he was invited to preach there one year for this. And, and these are people who are very familiar with the scriptures, uh, other ministers, uh, people who go to church constantly, people who give up their a few days just so they can be together to grow closer, to dig into the word of God more. And I think it would be easy if you were asked to speak at one of these things to, to try to be more eloquent. To try to maybe think of something new, something they haven't heard before. And I think sometimes that's not what needs to be done. And so when I was listening to his sermon, I have quite a few of his sermons that are just saved on my computer that I can listen to. And when I was listening to this sermon, very early on he said these words. He said, what I'll say will be very clear and simple. And I'm sure you'll be able to understand what I say. And so I've tried to pattern a lot of what I do after the way he wrote sermons. I try to make them uh, worthwhile. I want us to leave here with some type of a challenge each time. But I try to make them simple for people to understand. So my points are usually one or two or three words long. They're not sentences long because people usually don't remember those. So I'll throw up a word or two and then talk about that word and what I mean for that point for the next five or ten minutes. I try to make it in a way that people understand it because I don't think we have to be eloquent. We don't need to be people who uh, win others with our individual knowledge. I know people have a greater knowledge than I do. I know people have do so many things greater than I do. But when we're proclaiming, all of us, the message of God to others, no matter what the setting is, whether it's in a church building, whether it's uh, out in public, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's with your family, we do it with the right perspective in mind. And we make sure it's done in a way that people can understand it. Because our witness requires the right perspective. But then you look at the second verse that Paul wrote there. He said these words, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And when you look at the second verse there, I see this, that our witness focuses on one person. When I read that verse, that's what I think of. Paul says here that my sole purpose for coming to you in the past, for coming to Corinth, in the first place, the first time was to bring attention to Christ Jesus, to his crucifixion, not on himself. And it was a, this is the one message that the Christian faith must offer to others. For Paul, it wasn't just enough to tell them about Jesus and his life. He understood, he knew the importance of telling them also about his death, his burial, his resurrection. See, it wasn't enough for Paul just to tell them about Jesus, the things he did on this earth, if he also didn't tell them why he came to do these things on this earth. And this was his main focus. Every single day of his life, it was the single most important thing on the mind of Paul. His whole purpose on that visit to Corinth the first time and throughout his life, once he became a follower of Christ, was to make Jesus known that Jesus would be lifted up. In John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus said these words. He says, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. 
It doesn't matter what nationality someone is. It doesn't matter their skin color. It doesn't matter what sex they are. Jesus will draw all unto him. And when he was lifted up on this cross and he was buried and he was resurrected, he made this possible for all mankind. In the 21st century, we live uh, in a world and our world is open to all kinds of alternatives when it comes to something like this. And, and Christians are told by a liberal world that we have to just accept these other things. It's a, it's a new time. But it's 2,000 years later. It's the 21st century. You have to accept these. And, and this is something that the Christian cannot accept. Because to accept this would mean that we do not accept the very words of Jesus when he says, I am the way. Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He didn't say, I'm one way or one of the best ways. He said, I am the way. And Paul wanted others to know that when he witnessed to others, his one focus was the one person, Jesus. There's a story about a, a man who was speaking at a chapel service at a, at a college one time. And they say that he reached under the pulpit and he pulled out a scroll. And he unrolled the scroll and he asked the, the, the members out there, the, the students in the audience, what they saw. And, and some of them said that they saw a picture of Jesus. And in a way, they did. But he looked at him and said, this is not a picture of Jesus on this scroll. He said, this is the New Testament. And what he meant was this. He explained to them that there was a lady in India who took the time to write in very small words the entire New Testament on this scroll. And she darkened some words and she lightened some other ones so that when you looked at it from an audience's point of view, you saw the picture of Jesus Christ. And then he looks at him and he says, this is a Bible. And when you present this book and its message, people must not only see simple words and ideas, but the person of Jesus Christ. See, that's what the Apostle Paul was willing and able to do every single day. That's what we're supposed to be willing and able to do every single day. Paul wanted to make sure that others knew that he, what he proclaimed to them first and foremost was nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Christ died on that Roman cross in Jerusalem. And his death was effective then and is just as effective now, almost 2,000 years later, to bring sinners to forgiveness. See, in our society, I think it's easy to get caught up in entertainment, in excitement, in all the noise and the lights around us. You know, we can be in churches and, and you can turn the lights off and you can have flashing lights all around in some churches. You can have music where you're not sure if you're at a concert or if you're in church. We have a lot of different programs that are going on within our churches and there's a lot of excitement gathered around this. And my question often is this, what are they excited about? Are they excited because the program is fun? Are they excited because... The music is their style and it sounds good. Are they excited because it's entertaining or because they have a speaker in front of them who captivates them with humor and, and things like that? Now, I'm not saying that these things are all wrong. But in the first century, the witness was, wasn't done through these things. The witness was done by making known that one person, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have a problem with programs for youth and getting together and having a good time and doing things. That's, that's part of being of the body of Christ, fellowshipping together and getting together and having some good times. I don't even have an issue with different styles of music if the focus is constantly on the one person, Jesus. Because our witness focuses on one person. Then in the third verse, when we looked at it earlier, Paul said, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. And you hear words like that from a man like Paul, and it kind of just makes me stop for a second and think. Paul came to somebody with weakness and fear and much trembling. How should I be approaching people? Because when I read that verse, our witness depends also on our presence. How we present ourselves to other people. How we are with other people. Paul the Apostle. One of the most influential men to ever walk on the face of this earth. I'm not just talking about one of the most influential Christians. One of the most influential men 
ever to walk on the face of this earth. Wrote so much of the New Testament, and we study that, and we live by that, and we teach by that. Very influential. But he says, I came to you in weakness and fear. It's like he's saying, listen, I'm coming to you as a man who is insufficient. And Paul was like that. See, once again, we see in this verse right here, the humbleness that a man like Paul spoke with and lived with. He wrote this way. He lived this way. It's who he was. Because it could have been easy for Paul to let pride really get in the way. He was extremely intelligent. And I'm sure that every city he went to, when he got there, people knew who he was. Word had spread about Paul all over. They knew who he was, and, and by having the right presence, he was able to still keep Christ as the sinner. Having the right presence is important. It's critical for the Christian. Because we can turn people off immediately from Jesus Christ if what they see in us at any point in time is arrogance or pride. See, Paul couldn't afford to walk into any of these places with any arrogance and pride. He had to be humble. He was being persecuted. He was being thrown out of these places. He faced opposition everywhere he went. In all these places, he was being arrested. He was being tortured because they worshipped other gods. He says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. You know, he could have had fear of the people or he may have had a fear that maybe he would fail the Lord. I don't know exactly everything about what he means right there. I think it speaks more of his humbleness. But however you look at it, he came to people with a presence once again of humility. See, our witness cannot be from a presence of arrogance and pride, but from a presence that shows humility. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. And I think Paul understood this. I think he understood where his wisdom came from in the first place. Whatever knowledge we have doesn't come from us. The beginning of knowledge comes from the fear of the Lord, from having all for God, from being, having reverence for, for God Almighty. And if we come before others to witness before them with a presence that shows arrogance or pride in any way, if we try to beat people over the head with a Bible and, and constantly just talk to them with our arrogance and are looking down on them and constantly just talking about the sins they're committing, what they're doing wrong, in most cases you turn people away. Now there is certainly a time and a place where we need to talk about the sins we commit, the things we do wrong, the sins that are going on in our world, in our society. But just like we looked at in our finisher series a few months ago, Paul told young Timothy to correct and rebuke people. That's part of what we're supposed to do, correct and rebuke people. But he also told them to encourage people. And that's the part that sometimes we leave out. Or the next part, he also said to do it with patience, great patience and careful instruction. We look, we, it's easy for people sometimes to do the correcting and rebuking part. It's the encouraging, it's the great patience, the careful instruction that we sometimes lack or fall, fall, fall back on. See, God's given us all a privilege. He's given us all a privilege to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And every single one of us is. Even when Jesus talked to people, he never really approached them with, with arrogance or pride. He could have overwhelmed them with his superior wisdom. But he never tried to do that. He usually said something that would make others think. But his presence was always love and humility. And that's the presence that others need to see in us. Because our witness depends on our presence. In the fourth verse there from earlier, Paul said the words, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now, I already talked about how he didn't use eloquence or superior wisdom, so I'm not going to touch on the wise and persuasive words. He didn't use that. But he says he used a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And when I see that right there, it tells me that our witness shows power. Our witness must show the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think too often people want others to see their creativity. They want them to see how well they play an instrument. 
uh, how great they can sing or even how great they can preach or how they can captivate you with humor or whatever it is. What it all comes down, though, to is this. Our witness shouldn't and doesn't boast about our own abilities. Our witness shows the abilities that we have because God has blessed us with those through the Holy Spirit that is working in us. That's what Paul was able to do so often and what he was able to write about. What he's writing about here, he makes it known, once again, it's not about me. It wasn't my wise words. It wasn't eloquence. It wasn't persuasive words. What I've been doing is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he made that known over and over. I think Paul had this point down pat that it wasn't about him. It was all about God. It's clear throughout his writings that Paul doesn't want to take granted. He doesn't want to take credit for, for all these successes that he had in his life. Paul wanted all the glory and all the honor to go to God during this time. And so he says, I don't present my message to you with wise and persuasive words, but with the Spirit's power. What he's really saying here to me is that I can't take the credit for all this stuff that is happening because what is really happening is that the Holy Spirit is guiding me through my work in all phases. And it should be the same with us. Now, if you look at the book of Acts, you start off in the first chapter. You start off with Jesus there with his followers. And he's getting ready to ascend back into heaven. But before he ascends back into heaven, he gives them these words in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now these people, these same people that Jesus was telling this to, were the ones who ran and hid when he was arrested. The one who denied him three times when he, after he was arrested. They were the ones who went into hiding after he was buried. Only to come out after his resurrection. After they saw him. These were the ones that Jesus said this to in Acts 1.8. The ones who ran and hid. These are the ones he looked at just a few weeks later and said, You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But before Jesus told them that you're going to be my witnesses, he tells them you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. It's going to come upon you. And in Acts chapter 2, the next chapter, we read about the Holy Spirit coming upon them and the power that they received from them. And these same people became fearless people. So they went from people who were afraid and terrified and hiding to being <laughs> fearless and willing to do whatever needed to be done for Jesus. And that included dying for the name of Jesus. See, through the power of God and the Holy Spirit, the church was born. Peter was able to stand up in front of that large crowd in Acts chapter 2 and preach what we know as the first gospel sermon. We read in Acts about how the church was spreading like a wildfire. It was growing all over, just like Jesus told those disciples that it would there. They would be his disciples all over. And we see that beginning to happen all throughout the book of Acts. And the power that these men had, the power that these men had to do the works that they did to help the church grow came from the Holy Spirit, not from their own abilities, not because they were eloquent, not because they had superior wisdom, but from the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we need to understand that our witness should be showing the power of the Holy Spirit and the abilities that God is blessing us with. Because our witness shows power. And then in the last verse there in verse 5 that we looked at earlier, Paul said this, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And what I think we see there is that lastly and quickly, our witness has a purpose. And Paul is once again pointing out here He's pointing out them, to them why he doesn't take any of the credit and showing where all of this credit comes from. Paul didn't want their faith to be something superficial. 
He didn't want their faith to be strengthened by, by just some wise and persuasive words by someone preaching to them. He wanted them to have a faith that relied on God's power. See, our faith needs to rest on something as strong as the power of God, not on a soft foundation that comes just because we like the way someone once presented the gospel to us. Because they were funny, because they were humorous, because uh, they made us think about it in a different way. Those can help, yes. Because God can use speakers. He can use individuals who speak well to be his witnesses. And he does that. But we must do it in a way that Paul did. And the way that Paul showed us here in these verses. If we're only responding to wise and persuasive words from a man. And not to the power of God. Then our foundation of faith is often on soft ground. And Jesus said, the man who listens to my, hears my words and obeys them and listens to them and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on what? On the rock. And when the rains came and the streams rise and the winds blew and beat against that house, that house stands firm because it's on a firm foundation. But the man who builds his house on the sand, on a soft foundation, when the, when the rains came and the streams rise and the winds blow and beat against that house, it falls with a great crash because it's not on a firm foundation. You see, for us, our faith, if it's just resting on the words of a preacher and not on the power of God, then our faith can easily fall when storms and problems of this world beat against us. And the purpose for making an effective witness is so that people will rely on the power of God, not on the wisdom of men. Now, Paul uses the wisdom that he blesses men with, but it all goes to the power of God. Paul even wrote about people who claim to be godly, but deny the power of God. When he was writing his second letter to Timothy, in the third chapter, in verse 5, he was talking about godlessness in the last days as he opened up that third chapter. You know, he's talking about a lot of things that we even see, we really see in today's world. But in the fifth verse, he said this, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. He said, have nothing to do with them. And Paul was talking in this section about some of the terrible actions that mankind will live by and that we actually see going on today. And have a form of godliness. These are people who claim to be godly. They claim to be holy. They claim to be righteous. But in reality, it's like they're putting on a mask and deceiving God's people. Sometimes the danger about a witness is that it can be cleverly disguised. And many will accept it as a form of godliness. Now you can see it on social media, you can see it in our world, you can see it on TV, wherever. That people who are non-Christians will watch someone who claims to be a Christian, but they're not living it, they're not walking it, they don't live what they profess. They're living in sin, and that person who's a non-Christian will be quick to point out the faults with Christianity. The fault isn't with Christianity. The fault is with that individual. But sometimes maybe we or, or these other people are simply ones who have a form of godliness but are denying God's power being the source. See, the witness of the early church had great power and a strong witness for the 21st century must also be rooted in this great power from God. See, our witness has a purpose. And I believe that for the church to be truly effective, as we close here, as I believe as our church to be in the, in the world to be truly effective in America and across the world in the 21st century, it'll need to be a strong witness to our world. That leads people to put their trust in the power of God and not on human wisdom. Everyone in the church is a witness for God. And as we go out and be witness for the, witnesses for those around us, may we do it with the right perspective. May we focus on the one person that really matters. May we do this with a presence of humility. May we show others the power of the Holy Spirit. And may our witness have the purpose of making sure we are rooted in the power of God and not on the wisdom of men. A first century witness for a 21st century world 
is our guide for the church. We need stronger witnesses. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning, however you were joining us, or whether you watch this later on. Thank you for joining us and being part of our fellowship together. You know, our world needs stronger witnesses for Christ. We need people who, uh, when they look at us, they see the humility that people like Jesus and Paul and the, the first century Christians often had. And humility may be something that is lacking today in some of the church. We want people to see our talents. We want them to see how good we are. We want them to, to see how well I play an instrument or how well I speak or how well I do this or that. And we often forget to give God the credit and the glory when those things are going on. We must be stronger witnesses. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings, Father. We thank you for your love, God. We thank you for uh, that even though we're such imperfect people, Father, that even though we're people who, who, who live life selfishly at times, Father, that, uh, Father, we can be made new through you and your Son, Jesus Christ. So, God, I pray that you watch over us and help us to be stronger witnesses for you, people who will lead others to you based on how we present ourselves, Father, and how we live our lives, and, and, and that people understand that it's not anything special about us, Father, but it's all comes back to your power and the power of the Holy Spirit and you leading us through each step. Father, we're so thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ. We probably we pray for any of those who are lost, Father, that they can reach out to us, Father, that they can be remade and be made new in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let's get you to lead us and guide us. Help us to be faithful, to be strong witnesses. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to go into a time of communion here at Jefferson, just like we have been doing the last few weeks. I got a look from Terry. We're going to go into a time of communion here at Double Creek. I don't know why I even do that. I never even preached there one time. But we're going to go into our time of communion here at Double Creek, as we always do each week. And uh, we're going to continue what we've been doing the past couple of months during this time where we've been uh, social distancing and quarantining. And we're going to give a small little uh, communion meditation, a prayer, and, and Amy will play a song for us, and you can just take it whenever you're, you're ready. But you know, God, uh, as each one of us are witnesses for Jesus Christ, uh, we're witnesses because of what he was willing to do for us. The only reason we have the power that we have is because God has blessed us with that power. The reason we have the Holy Spirit is because God was willing to send His Holy Spirit to help us. The only reason we have the church is because Jesus was willing to do what we celebrate each Sunday morning. So we celebrate at this time and such an awful event, Father, people, but such a, a loving and wonderful event, an event of humility, an event of, of Jesus just showing what a servant He was and what He came to do. He came to suffer for us. And because He was coming here willing to suffer, and take the pain that he did and shed his blood for us and die on that cross and be resurrected three days later and send back into heaven because he was willing to do that we have the opportunity each Lord's Day to be able to remember that and to focus on that Matthew 26 verse 26 6 through 29 it says while they were eating Jesus took some bread and after a blessing he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, it's such a beautiful passage, but when you think about it, it doesn't even begin to tell what he went through. So we remember this each week. That the bread represents his body. That the blood represents the, the blood that he was willing to shed for us. So as Amy comes forward and gets ready to play a song, just be willing to take this whenever you're ready. Let's say it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for your many blessings. God, we're thankful for this opportunity. It's special each week, Father. It uh, becomes more and more special as you go through it each week, Father, just as you can remember what Jesus was willing to do for it, and we can look at ourselves and realize that we can be made new, and we are who we are because of Jesus Christ and what he went through. 
during our time this morning of communion, God, I pray that it will be a time where we focus solely on Jesus Christ, the punishment he went through, and the lives we lived with. We love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning once again. You know, it's great that we can be able to meet together in some way. It's not the same as being in person, and, and, uh, and we know that our responsibility is to be the church, not go to church, but we also know that the Bible tells us not to forsake meeting together. And so uh, it's important. It's, uh, we're not people who were created to be isolated, to be on your own. And as, as, as lucky as we are, as blessed as we are to be able to have Facebook Live and be able to stream things and meet together this way, uh, we miss everyone and we're looking forward to when we can all be back here again real soon. Now, if you need anything from us, reach out to us. If you need someone to go to the grocery store for you, pick up something or pick you up and take you somewhere, just come by and talk. We can social distance while we do it or wear masks or whatever you want to. It's a... We don't want anyone to feel like you're alone and you don't have people that love you and care for you here. So, you know, we love this church. We love this church family. We love the, the people in this community. And so uh, I'm going to pray real quick and then we'll close this out. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, God. We just thank you for your many blessings. A beautiful day, Father, just to be able to be in your word, Father. And just, uh, Father, we're just thankful for all the people that just love you, Father, that are listening in or, or here watching, Father. And we just... I pray that you be with us as we go throughout this week, Father. Be with those we've mentioned earlier today, Father. You know our hearts and desires, and you know uh, that there are so many things going on, Father, and people we may have even forgot to mention, Father. Just, uh, Father, we pray that whatever your will is, that we understand it and that we we're able to, to accept it. Father, we pray that you watch over us as we leave here today, Father, and as we go through this world, Father, that, uh, that we'll be witnesses for you, Father, that we do it with humility and grace and truth and love. Lead us and guide us. Keep us safe. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.